Mr. Mason. Yeah, hi. It's a great thing to have you back on the show. Obviously, we've had you on many times here. Only you know and I know. Now, ever since reading it, now I've got the, the, the song stuck in my head for uh, like a earworm kind of deal. But um, one of the cool <laughs> things about this is, and I'm hoping you'll take the role of storyteller really to heart because this is your uh, Hawaii Public Radio. This is a real opportunity here from head to toe. I always love the books. And while there are a lot of stars in it, Certainly for, for me and for, you know, if your mom introduced you to people like Led Zeppelin and, and uh, Jimi Hendrix, maybe it, it, you could relate. You know, your mom is a star in a lot of ways in your journey. And I was hoping you take us from the journey by sea and air with your mom, which leads to really how you got to the guitar and ironically by way of the ukulele. Oh, well, um See, I, I don't, I, I don't remember what exact year it was, uh, but it would have been in the fifties. But anyway, my sister that was basically eighteen years older than me, I didn't really ever know her. Um, so we um, briefly, and then she moved to America in the early fifties with a friend of hers, Pat Harris, and. Um, so, uh, you know, I forget how old I was, roughly, um, probably about 11 or so. Um, but my mother and I went and visited her. She moved to San Diego is where she was. So I was, he back, I was, I came here then to the U S came over on the Queen Mary, <laughs> uh, Flight across America was seven hours and a DC seven. People used to dress nicely. The service was impeccable. Uh, unfortunately, that seems to have gone way downhill. Machinery got better and the service got worse. Um, and um, so that was my introduction to coming to America. And, and, and while staying with her, um, uh, you know, one of the things was the of course, the TV, which had so many different channels. I mean, we because we had one channel, basically, I grew up with, and that was the BBC mm. on TV, and that was black and white. And then, then you had ATV. Um, and then uh, and also the, the number of ra music on the radio was just, um, you know, it was great. And then I found that little ukulele in a trash can one day rummaging around. And just started <laughs> messing around with it. <laughs> Not that I really knew what the hell I was doing or anything. Sure. You know, any bad strings on it. But it opened so, the door. Well, I guess. <clears throat> I mean, I was into music in school. I was always in the plays and I was in the school choir. So I was very much, you know, music inclined. Sure. It's just a great story, though, that the ukulele is there at the sister's house. And uh, and just backing up, because I'm curious, because people don't do these really anymore, the transatlantic thing on, on a boat. How long of a journey, approximately, do you remember that being? You and your mom going across the Atlantic, correct? Yeah, so I think it was about five days. That's it? Yeah. Okay, it wasn't wasn't as, as long as, uh, as I thought it would be. Well, your mom... No, no, it was the queen, uh, I think it was the I can't remember, was it Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth? Okay, well, it was cranking is the story on that one. It wasn't moving at any Titanic speed, that's for sure. No, 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 they were, they were about five days across the Atlantic. Okay, that isn't too bad. Still, a, a really cool thing to do. And, and Dave's mom is, a, as I said, a star throughout the book, and I'm not going to spoil it, and we, yeah. could ne we could never get to all the stories. But one of the other cool things is how opportunities happen and seizing little opportunities. And so... A very early one, flashing to that, and hoping, again, because you, you did a great job telling that story, and I thank you for it. But there's a time that uh, you are a roadie for the Spencer Davis group. And ironically, yeah. there's a night that Steve Winwood himself does not show up. Pick up the story. Well, I sort of <laughs> played around at being a roadie for about three months prior to Steve leaving, officially leaving the Spencer Davis group and traffic forming. Um, so it was sort of a way to be hanging out and be together. Um, and yeah, one, it just, he didn't turn, turn up for a show one night and Spencer was like, well, Dave, come on, you can, you can get up and, 
and take his place. I'm like, what are you nuts? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I was 18, nine, 18, 19 years old. And, you know, Steve Winwood was, was sort of, Steve so Winwood was sort of one of those people that was born, you know, naturally to with talent. It was one of those unique individuals. Me, I kind of had to work for it. So at the time, I really, you know, I wasn't really, you know, I didn't feel it was like, you nuts, I can't do this. <laughs> and so he goes, no, nah, come on, come on, come on. You can do it. You can do it. So we <laughs> get up and did it. You know, I forget, I forget, I sort of forget, you know, but anyway, I guess we pulled it off and everybody seemed happy enough. So, yeah. No. <laughs> Those are the kind of things that uh, that happen a few times for Dave. Now, there's another one that connects him to an even, just it's, it's a, a remarkable one. It's March 1967. The Who do not show up for a gig that you happen to be at as a fan. You're not even a roadie. You're a fan. <laughs> Tell everybody. Oh, yeah, me and Jim were both, me and Capaldi. Yeah, it was the Malvern Winter Gardens. And the, they, didn't turn, they didn't show up. But we knew... But their gear was all set up, ready to do his show, because the road is who we knew um, from, uh, you know, <laughs> I just for worked out <laughs> that Jim and I decided, you know what, to the hell with it. The gear's already here, guys. And the roadies were like, yeah, come on, why don't you just get up there? So me and Jim got up there, and Jim on drums, and I had Pete Townsend's rig. <laughs> And on the microphone, we just sort of, I just said, anybody out there play bass? <laughs> somebody jumped up, you know, somebody jumped up on stage. And I forget what the hell we even did, but we just thrashed around for a, for a while. And then the end of the show just trashed everything. <laughs> the amps, the drums, the, the road is joined in with that one. And you so, smashed Pete Townsend's guitar yourself. <laughs> How crazy yeah. is that? I mean, who can who can say they've smashed uh, Pete <laughs> Pete's guitar? Have you ever? Did you ever get to tell Pete Townsend that story? Uh, I met him a couple of times. I didn't actually. <laughs> okay, yeah, sometimes you just don't get a, a chance to do that. Um, now, there's an interesting thing. Another thing is Dave's fascinating love life, uh, love lives. I guess I'm uh, trying to think of the correct grammar for that. There's lots of girls that that factor throughout the book. It's a girlfriend in the late '60s, Carol Russell. Now, Carol, talented artist who designed the traffic logo. In fact, among output that she did, she also was doing some interesting. Uh, stuff for the Beatles that led to your first encounter with Paul McCartney. Just kind of tell that story and how it leads to Abbey Road and really to another Beatle, George. Well, Carol was she had the uh, she was at the Royal College of Art and that she was she had the run of every department there. She's pretty amazing talent, and uh, Paul had hired her to. She was making it this couch a transparent couch that had all the characters from the Sgt. Pepper album in it. And so Paul, uh, one evening, had come by to see how things were going with it. And that's basically how I got to meet him. Um, and he was a traffic fan. And that led, of course, to, you know, I would, you know, I would go down to, uh, down to Abbey Road occasionally when they were recording. And that led to a, a, a very cool relationship with George. Um, Lennon was a little, Lennon was not that approachable person. Um, and Ringo was sort of, but, but certainly with McCartney and George, I, I developed a, a little bit of a relationship, more with George, I suppose. Well, they're they're guys that come up again and again throughout the book. So uh, this is just they one. do. You know, George was uh, and gave me my my his guitar that he uh, sitar that he first started working on with to play around with, and um, actually played me the uh, in his house. I was went down to visit him in Escher, and he uh, played me the. Uh, the first time I heard Sergeant Pepper was he played me the new, he said, well, when I hear the new album, it's like, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was my introduction to Sergeant Pepper. And then of course I did some other things with him and he actually recorded on a, um, 
Uh, well, one of my songs on an album. Yeah, and you also, you describe his house, you use a great word, uh, staggering when you describe his house in, in Surrey, I guess. Well, the one in Hanley was is, is was a huge mansion, a huge estate. That that place was, yeah, you know, it was a, uh, it was a, um, it was a big, huge old house. <laughs> you got there, and he was alone. Try to set that story, which is well. Just that was in Asher. That was he lived that he had like a bungalow on a golf course, there. Right. That that was before Henley. There is, uh, as you go through the story, um, you have a powerful run-in at a private London club. This is January '68. It would lead to you being on an epic recording by this artist. Um, tell the story. I guess this is the one of the first encounters with Jimi Hendrix. Um, well, Hendrix, I saw Hendrix when he first came over in the same place McCartney first saw him. In fact, Paul may have been there that night. I don't remember. A little tiny place called Scotch St. James. Right, that's it. Which um, Chaz Chandler sort of dragged him around these little clubs. Little time, they're semi private mm -hmm. clubs, and he just this guy got up and plugged in and started jamming with this little band that was playing. It was like, Oh my god, who the hell is this guy? And then, um, then later, you know, after he, um, after, um, um, Hey Joe, which was his first recording over there, um, there was another club called blazes semi-private again where pretty much everybody would go you know all these places you'd run into everybody there because mm -hmm. that's where you'd go for, for something late night to eat or if you would just want to go out and drink and he was there one night sitting at a table by himself and i just sort of basically just sat down and said hey man i'm just a huge fan and started talking and he was a fan of traffics and that's how i struck up a sort of friendship with hendrix which led to me being at the one time I had left at that period, the first time I left traffic, um, actually things weren't going well with no Redding. So we were seriously talking about me joining the band in, in as the bass player. And so I got to record and do some stuff with Hendrix. One of them was all along the watchtower, sang on Crosstown traffic. And then there's a number, there was, about three or four tracks floating around out there somewhere with me playing bass and sitar on when when you did the uh when you were sitting there in the studio with the acoustics describe sitting face to face with him what do you remember though well we hung out i mean i was at that point it was you know we i mean i would be at his we a couple of times with him at late at night at his apartment just playing records listening to music so there were there were times we'd we'd hung out before doing a session so mm -hmm. it was just like at that point it was like just doing a session you were doing watchtower or something right you guys are sitting there well yeah i mean i did, did the thing you know we he we were both at somebody's uh, um went over to a, a girl a, a girlfriend of his uh who, who had a copy of the john wesley harding album pre uh, preview copy which we went over one afternoon to listen to with there was, a, there was a few other people there and I guess something struck him about Watchtower mm. um, and so it was like yeah come on we're gonna I'm going down the studio come on down and um, let's work on this so yeah I just sat we was just basically laid the track was basically just laid down with me and him and Mitch Mitchell unbelievable and, and, yeah that's a really uh, yeah. well he was awesome you know there was lots of guitar a lot of a lot of great guitar players out there but there ain't no more Jimi hendrix's no but i hear you you have a great shot in the book there's some cool pictures by the way i should give that a plug in the book you get to see some neat pictures one of them is a jimmy it looks like you guys are getting on a plane do i have that wrong you flew some some yeah. where were you going that was, a, that was a, a uh for a festival over in amsterdam traffic Hendrix, um, sure, I forget who else was on that show. And y'all were flying from from England to Amsterdam. I'm taking it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, wow. And that uh, neat stories like that. So you have any fun like the other side is these offstage moments, I guess. Are there anything fun, totally non-musical that you can remember about your relationship with him that is not a musical thing, but it's like that human touch. You're on a plane together, maybe the kind of food he liked or a meal you shared or just something that has zero to do with music, but more to do with just hanging. And, and well, most of those times we're at his house, I mean, we're, like myself, his favorite guitar player was Albert King. Mm. We play a lot of blues stuff. Um, you know, those moments were uh, when we weren't playing. Or afterwards, we'd go, like there were a couple of times we'd, we'd go out and went to Blazers. There were always a band playing in these, in these semi-private clubs. So we got up and jammed a few times. Um, got up and did something with him at the Royal Albert Hall. I think there's actually... There's a YouTube of that actually somewhere. Yeah, traffic opened for him that night too, and then you yeah. Played, then you so I got yes exactly. Then you played with him later. Yeah, there's a lot of these that are in there, and there's some really weird ones too that are that are kind of pop culture ish. There's a Salvador Salvador Dali that I mean, there's like I said, there's just too many to get into. In, in uh, I'd I'd wear Dave down. But... Oh well, Dali, yes. Well, he's my all time favorite artist. Right. Well, I wanted him to. Do... I want. I want. I was hoping he'd do an album cover for me. Right. So I got to went and met with him in New York. Um, I didn't work out, unfortunately. But right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge, uh, I'm a big Dolly fan. No, I know other artists. I can't remember who it is, Dave. But another cat I interviewed who did a book has a Dolly. Same kind of story. Meeting Gala and uh, his wife and and him. But uh, there's another crazy kind of story in here. Uh, which is another pop American culture kind of story. So after moving to L.A., meeting Amy Folger, and the one night you went to a house that would become, unfortunately, infamous, and you met the legendary late great actress Sharon Tate. I didn't, well, I didn't meet Sharon Tate. I just... Oh, you never uh, met her? You didn't? Okay, from the book. It's, no, I just... No, that was all... They, they were... That was because of Cass Elliot. Mm-hmm. In that the uh, Wojtek Fikowski, Abby Folger, um, Melcher, mm -hmm. all those people, they, they were sort of that Hollywood clique. Right. So they were friends with, 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 with Cass. And that's kind of where I spent a lot of time when I first came over here. Because mm -hmm. um, I had friends from England living there with her. Right. So that's sort of how that happened. And, a couple, you know, I was... Went to a couple of things over at that house. I mean, I was there, you know, maybe, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I, it, it's, you know, I could have even have been there that night if, if things had been any different. So that was the time frame. So it was like the summer of 69 is when you actually. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was there maybe a few a week, a few weeks before that all happened. And Sharon was not there the night you went, you're saying? Not that I don't. Yeah, no, I don't think she was there. Wow, but it was that house, the exact house. Yeah, those people in that house. Wow, where where the uh, horrific... Uh, Welcome to L.A. Yeah, well, I mean, but it's an interesting... Uh, and then from a different kind of house, uh, before we wrap it up with you, I was hoping you'd... Because you talked a little bit about the George. You have a lot of Eric Clapton stuff in there, and uh, you write that... It was a brief thing, but as, as I'm kind of paraphrasing you, as a new member of Derek and the Dominoes, you write... We got to hear about George Harrison's uh, houses earlier. Describe getting to spend uh, time at Clapton's. You refer to it as camping out at Eric Clapton's for a little while. Uh, well, Eric got, you know, he really Eric got to know all those people from Delaney and Bonnie because we, because I was, Opening. I played with them for, for a while when I first came here. Right. And, they opened a lot of the blind face shows. Correct. So that's what, how Eric really got to, got together with all those people, got very influenced by, well, Delaney produced one of his albums. Um, and um, so, yeah, so when that broke up and he pretty much took most of all that band, I was originally at the very beginning a member of Derek and the Dominoes. Right. For a minute. Um but things, you know, we were, as I write in the book, things were going in different directions. Eric and Vine, you know, unfortunately, um, I got introduced to heroin. Right. Via um, 
the drummer, what, um, um, I'm trying to think. Um, but you were there for a while at that house and just any, any memories of like what it was like to be and what his place was like. We had a beautiful place, old Spanish style house on a nice estate. Um, and everybody was there pretty much camp was living there. Hey. Um, and was just pretty much sort of just hanging out and trying to come up with some music and just noodling around with stuff. And that was basically the, the whole thing. We did, we did one show at, I think the, the Hammersmith Odeon, I think. Right. Right. That's really cool. Well, there's so many great stories in this thing. I hope people uh, enjoy it as much as I did, because if you're, if you know the late sixties, early seventies, then the book only, you know, and I know uh, a lot of the same as Dave's songs are, it, the stories are going to be familiar to you. One last little tiny one. Cause we talked about houses because a lot of cool visits to houses. You, one of my, when, when I was a little boy before kiss, there was the monkeys you were at Peter Tork's house. You were monkeying around there. Any cool memories or stories about being with one of the monkeys? Well, I was there because that's because that's where uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash had rented the house. That's where they, that's where they put the band together. Was there? Yeah. Was Peter there at all? You ever? So he was not. I met him a couple of times. Was he cool? Yeah. He yeah, was, he was a nice. But basically, I knew the the house because that's like I said that you know. Yeah, yeah. They they rented it, and that's where they camped out. That's where they set everything up and worked it, on the Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I just think uh, it's cool because a long time ago, Hendrix, you, who you have all these connections to, Hendrix actually opened for the Monkees, which is a really funny yeah. thing. And so you kind of have your foot in both camps. Did you meet any of the other Monkees besides Peter? Um. Mickey Dolan's <laughs> here and there, and um, Davy Jones. I think, yeah, just briefly. But they were nice. They were cool guys. They were easygoing. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really spend any time with them. I mean, they just came. You know, I just made up to cross the past professionally. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, a lot of that in there. There's so many. You were there at the Queen Mary with Paul McCartney in in New Orleans or uh, the uh, in L.A. For God's sake, yeah. that great show that uh, with the meters. That's the night the meters did that famous record, and you were at that party. Yeah. So uh, it's a great book. I hope that uh, that uh, you've had fun talking about it today with us. And when are you going to be back in Hawaii? Are you you're on the mainland now? Yeah. I am, and we'll probably be back there in uh, in the fall through Christmas and stuff and New Year's. Probably doing that. You know, Shep Gordon does the. Uh, we usually do that New Year's Eve show for the um, for the food bank. Got to have like a Lahaina slant, I imagine, coming up again for. Uh... Um, well, Lahaina, unfortunately, is is not there anymore. <laughs> Sadly, yeah, that's sad. Yeah. So, um, but also, um, and then I have a song that I, you know, last I put, I put in a cool song called "Mangoes" that I, where I'm de donating um, some of the money back to the you know, the welfare. If people want to go to the website and check it out. Dave Mason music uh, com. Yeah. Dave Mason music.com. Cause I have a, an, an awesome mango tree in our garden over there in Wailea. <laughs> so I wrote this song called mangoes. So it's, which is kind of cool. I think uh, it's appropriate. It's more, it makes more sense than writing about uh, papaya. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, be safe brother. And it was great. Uh, did you have fun? Was this okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, giving you a big hug and a high five. Say hi to Winifred and uh, we'll catch you the next time around, my friend. I love Hawaii. Mahalo. Right on. Stay safe, Dave. You too. Bye-bye. Yep.